they're, they're in the house and they've been in school for a while. How many of you are other types of students at UCLA? Now, see, you guys are really noble because you still have a couple of weeks before school starts and you're here. How many of you are faculty or staff? <laughs> Alumni? All right. Not affiliated with UCLA. Very, very impressive. So we are so glad to have you all here today. Um, what I'm going to do is briefly um, introduce the panelists. And, and I say briefly because I refer you to their school websites to get more um, in-depth uh, background on their wonderful biographies and their publications. Um, after I do introductions, I'm going to talk a little bit about the format. And then I am going to talk a little bit about critical race theory and sort of what what are some of the assumptions we take for granted um, in, in critical race theory. So, um, so first of all, um, introductions. To my left is Dean um, Jennifer Mnookin. She is also the Price Professor of Law at UCLA. She graduated in um, 1988 from Harvard. And uh, we'll, we'll work all the, the you know, glicks out of the microphones on me. It'll be fine. Um, and she, she graduated from Harvard in 1988. Um, she graduated from Yale Law School in 1995. She has her PhD in history. And talk about these degrees because uh, I find that students are often interested in, in hearing these things and sort of situating people. Um, to my right is Professor Priscilla o Ocean, who is a uh, professor with <laughs> tenure at Loyola Law School, just downtown. Thank you. Thank you. Priscilla is a graduate of graduate, a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of San Diego State University and a graduate of UCLA Law School from 2007. Thank you. So Bruins. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Classic not guy. only was she a graduate of the critical race studies specialization, she was also, she returned in 2010 to be the critical race studies faculty fellow. And we're so delighted to have you Thank back you. today, Priscilla. Um, and to my far right, on the stage, but not otherwise, um, is <laughs> Sunita Patel, assistant professor of law here at UCLA, and in her first semester at UCLA. So let's give her a welcome. <laughs> Sunita has her bachelor's degree from Tulane in 2000, her law degree from American. Um, and she is working in the veterans uh, clinic, starting the veterans clinic. And so, you, again, I refer her to your um, to refer, refer you to her bio. Um, my name is Laura Gomez. I'm a professor here at UCLA School of Law. I also have faculty appointments in the departments of sociology and Chicana and Chicano studies. Um, I am a graduate of Harvard uh, as well. In fact, we knew each other as undergraduates at Harvard, even though I graduated two years earlier. Confession, true <laughs> confession. Um, uh, my law degree is from Stanford, and my PhD in sociology is from Stanford. Um, just a note about, uh, about format. Uh, we, what we are trying to do, once I get through some preliminaries, what we're trying to do is have a conversational format up here. We are um, each going to go around and make some comments and then go around another time and give each other basically a chance to respond to each other. So we're sort of trying to make it a little bit more interactive. And then we will have some time for questions from the audience um, uh, for the, the last part of the session. Um, one thing about timing is Professor I'm, Dean Manukin, we are so grateful that she changed her schedule to be here today, uh, but she does have to leave at 6 to get to the event that she pushed off to 6.30. So, um, so uh, we, we appreciate you doing Happy that, Jennifer. Um, okay, so one last preliminary note, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about critical race theory, and that is that we're a lot of people in this room. And uh, we have, as you know, I don't know what the number is, you know, maybe it's 100. Uh, we have as many views out there as we have people. And we are certainly not going to agree. And in fact, we should 
you know, have healthy disagreements and engagements with each other. But I uh, want to uh, remind you that we want to have a, a civil and respectful uh, level of disagreement with each other. And I think we'll model that up here because we're not going to agree on everything we're saying either. Um, but the important point is to have the discussion. Um, and that reminds me to say that we are having a second critical race studies at UCLA Law is having a second event um, on a, a part two to this conversation called Los Angeles. Los Angeles and why am I not remembering? The view from Los Angeles, uh, anti-racist lawyering and activism, which will be a panel featuring our alumni. Um, and that will be October 24th from 6 to 8 p.m. So look for news of, of that event. Um, I am going to sit down now and talk a little bit just very briefly about critical race theory and what kind of approach to law it has. Certainly, uh, critical race theorists in the legal academy write about race and the law, but they do so from a particular perspective that has three components. Uh, one is, is that we take it as uh, true and uh, fundamentally uh, accurate to say that racism is structural. Racism is institutional. It is embedded in the uh, institutions of society. Um, number two. We believe scholars in this field uh, accept the pro proposition that racism is ubiquitous. It is everywhere and it is common and um, it may take different forms. So for example, in the last couple of decades, there's been a lot of scholarship on implicit bias. I see a bunch of 1Ls in the room and you had a great lecture on implicit bias from one of our CRS alums during orientation and from um, uh, the uh, someone from the, both of them from the Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. Um, but it also takes explicit forms, right? And certainly we have more examples of explicit racism from the, the past, but uh, as we can, as we all know from recent events, we have examples of explicit racism in the, the very much in the present as well. And the third thing that I would say um, is that one of the tenets of critical race theory is that racism is intransigent, meaning that it's deep and it's hard to get rid of. Um, other scholars in law who write about anti-discrimination law take a different approach and they say, well, there are lots of things that we can do in terms of formal equality to get rid of racism. We can create the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We can create the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And certainly many uh, people in critical race theory would agree with those initiatives, but we might disagree with the anti-discrimination proponents in the extent to which we think they can really ameliorate racism. Um, I think I will talk, stop there in the interest of, of time in terms of CRT generally, and I'm going to just go right into my individual comments, um, and then uh, we will proceed with Priscilla, uh, Priscilla's comments, Jennifer's comments, and then Sunita's comments. Um, I want to start by just talking a little bit about the current political moment. Uh, uh, the, of the last couple of years. Um, and uh, the Trump campaign for the GOP nomination, um, and in particular, take you back to a moment in 2015 when he was making his campaign announcement. And he said that all Mexicans, um, or he said some Mexicans are rapists. They're rapists, they're criminals, they're um, bringing drugs over the border. This was a moment in which he didn't mince words about who he was assigning blame to, who he was scapegoating. Um, and he didn't do it in a dog whistle way, which had been for a couple of decades the way that uh, some elements of the Republican Party had been talking about African Americans and, for example, African American crime and even Latino crime. He didn't camouflage it that way. He came right out with it. And what I was struck by from, from you know, my uh, areas of expertise 
was that people didn't really call that racism at the time. They said it was xenophobic. They said it was nativist. Um, they said it was stupid. <laughs> you know, there were a lot of things, but they, they tended not to label it racism. And what I want to argue is that we must understand that as racism and um, that that demonization of Mexicans, Latinos, of Muslim immigrants and refugees, um, and at even the, the use of border security as, um, as racism. Um, that doesn't mean that it's only those things, but that it's fundamentally, uh, we should understand it as uh, promoting white supremacy. Now, the thing about it is Trump did not come up with these ideas on his own. He didn't he didn't come in, you know, and say, ah, I'm going to, he, he didn't, he, he built on a long wave. Um, and that wave I want to talk about starting here in California, actually, with in 1996 with Proposition 187, for those of you who were, um, were living here at the time, I had recently come to California. Um, it was a, it was a crazy time. Uh, <laughs> Proposition 187 was a anti-immigrant law, which ended up not being enforced because the district judge here, the federal district judge here in California who heard the case said that it wasn't enforceable. And then the state of California did not appeal it. Um, but the unexpected consequences of that move were the, it, was, it was really the end of the GOP at the statewide level in California and the politicization of an entire generation of Latinos who, who eventually became those who advocated for DACA status and for recognition as dreamers and so forth. So um, maybe I'll say a minute, uh, just a minute more about the demographics. So part of why I think that in this present moment, Many whites, I'm trying to be careful about that, some whites are fearing immigrants generally and Mexicans in particular is that Mexicans are, Mexican Americans and Latinos are growing as a proportion of this nation's population, right? We're 20, we're 17 percent of the population now and will be 30 percent by mid-century. 70% of Latinos are Mexican-American. The average age of Latinos is 29 compared to 43 for whites, for non-Hispanic whites. And so again, thinking about youth and mobilization and thinking about voters begins to tell you about some of the, the basis for some of the fear. Um, one thing that's very interesting is between 2000 and 2010, the population of Latinos in seven southern states doubled. Now, that's still a small proportion of the overall Latino population in the United States, which is a very urbanized population, a very much a population on the coast. Um, for example, 28% of the nation's Latinos live in California. 8% um, live in Florida. 7% live in New York. 20% uh, live in Texas. Um, but you begin to see that these demographics uh, really, really help us understand why there is a uh, movement, uh, a movement at the at the grassroots, a white movement um, that is threatened by those kinds of numbers. And we can look to historical antecedents to see that. And I'll talk a little bit when we come back around about some of that longer term history. I'm going to turn it over, Priscilla, to you. Thank you. Um, so first, I want to thank Jasleen and the Critical Race Studies uh, program for one, uh, you know, sort of raising me up, as it were, um, as a 24 year old. I won't say how long ago that was, but um, yes, that's today. that's the fact. Um, um, and sort of teaching me what um, not everything I know, but uh, some of the most significant things I know about law, race, and inequality. And I want to thank uh, Professor Gomez for uh, con convening us and. Contrary to what she said, I actually do agree with everything that she says. So uh, there's no daylight between our opinions. Anyway, so um, 
So, you know, I, I wanted to talk about my, my reaction to sort of the images coming out of, you know, Charlottesville, um, the home of the University of Virginia, this protest of the, um, the removal of the statue of Robert E. Lee, the home of Thomas Jefferson, um, and the images, right, of these young white men in khakis and uh, T-shirts carrying tiki torches, uh, saying things like, white lives matter, blood and soil, Jews will not replace us, right? Um, that sort of being flashed on the television incessantly. And then listening to the sort of media take or the framing of those images and these young white men saying those things, uh, you know, white lives matter and so forth, making these sorts of chants as exceptional, um, as misguided young people, right? These white supremacists, they, didn't, they, they use other sorts of terms, but finally they got to call these folks neo-Nazis and AKK and so forth while they had been using euphemisms like the, the alt-right before that. Um, but in some ways framing these folks as exceptional, as overcome by white grievance, um, as unusual and inconsistent with American uh, values. And Professor Gomez uh, gave me a lot of time, five minutes, to kind of uh, unpack uh, my reaction to it. But one of the things that um, I want to say about uh, the, the, what I want to talk about in my five minutes and probably come back around later is, is how wrong that is. I want to take a word from the 45th president, wrong, right? He used that word a lot. And thank you. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Um, how wrong that is, right? That this, this, this notion of white racial grievance that's motivating these protests, right? It's not exceptional or aberrational, but rather it's normal and foundational, particularly to our constitutional order and our constitutional jurisprudence around racial inequality. And I want to say, I want to take just a couple of examples of what I mean by this. And in some ways, the protests and the violence that we saw was the weaponization of colorblindness. And I know many of you are taking that the, uh, constitutional law, right? And understand that term, right? It's the weaponization of colorblindness. But, so what do I mean by that? In this sort of constitutional ju jurisprudence around racial inequality, one of the central framings of white uh, individuals and litigants and white communities is that white folks are merely one ethnic group, right? Um, that they don't, that it's not, that whiteness is not a social structure. That whiteness doesn't organize and distribute power. Right? And so you see this, for example, in, and this allows for an obscuring of the way in which whiteness functions to subordinate, to exclude, to marginalize, to arrange um, structural racism, right? to enable structural racism. So one of the examples comes out of uh, Justice Powell's opinion in Baki, right? where the argument was we shouldn't apply strict scrutiny to race-based affirmative action because the idea behind the 14th Amendment in the first place was to um, upend mechanisms of subordination, particularly as they affected African Americans, and we need to make distinctions between benign and invidious discrimination. And Justice Powell rejected that, partially because he framed whiteness as just one of many ethnic identities in the United States that have been subject to discrimination. So I'm quoting him here. Right, he says, during the dormancy of the Equal Protection Clause, and so he's, he's talking about a, a time when the, the, the Equal Protection Clause wasn't very um, uh, vibrant, and we can whether there was ever a time where the 14th Amendment was vibrant, we'll set that aside, right? So he says, the United States has become a nation of minorities. Each had to struggle, and to some extent, struggle still to overcome the prejudices of a monolithic minority, excuse me, monolithic majority. And so here again, whites are framed as one group who has been subject to discrimination at various points in time, and so shouldn't be burdened, for example, uh, with a, uh, an admissions program that takes race into consideration or um, enables people of color to enter into institutions of higher learning, right? Because it's undeserved, right? To label whites who have also experienced discrimination as um, the propagators of discrimination. It eliminates the way that whiteness is functioning. And this, we see this more recently in, in parents um, involved in city schools, right? Where Justice Roberts basically is basically framing whites as one of many who not who are not groups who are not particularly empowered, and suggests that the only way to stop discrimination is not to address white racial power, right, and structural racism, but just to stop discriminating, right? Because whites shouldn't be discriminated against either, given their history. Um, and you also see this sort of constitutionalization of white innocence. Right. So while power is aggregated and we see that responsibility for that power is not right, it's individualized. 
And so if the individual white person, it cannot be shown that the individual white person has propagated or benefit, has propagated racial discrimination, right? Then they shouldn't be burdened with it. And so you see this constantly over and over again in the various kinds of litigation that come before the Supreme Court. So for one example, um, if there is an effort to ameliorate racial discrimination against people of color, then saddling, saddling white folks with that is unfair because they are fundamentally innocent, right? They, while, they, um, while power may be structured around whiteness as a structural identity, because whiteness is seen as an individual identity, all of that is obscured. And so, and we see this again and again. So you see this in cases like Ricci versus Stefano, and importantly, Shelby County. And Shelby County is important. This is a case that involved a challenge to the Voting Rights Act, uh, particularly section four, sections four and five, which enabled the Justice Department to basically deal with some of the worst mechanisms of voter suppression, right? And in Shelby County, the justices, the majority, when they gutted that uh, aspect of the Voting Rights Act, really focused on whites as victims and whites as innocents, right? Being burdened with this history of uh, white supremacy, which was undeserved, right? Because individual whites are the ones, are the unit of measure. And so to aggregate that harm and to aggregate that history and to aggregate that power was seen as unfair and impermissible. And as we know, right, voter suppression paid, played a key role in Donald Trump's election. So white grievance and the sort of weaponization of colorblindness in the political arena in this way through the lens of white innocence and white victimization um, literally put Donald Trump in the White House and as I'll talk about in the, the next uh, round of uh, comments authorizes the kind of political expression that we saw on uh, TV that isn't, norm that isn't exceptional or aberrational but normal and foundational to how we think about racial equality. Great. Um, so first of all, I too want to thank uh, I want to thank the, the CRS program and Jocelyn and uh, Laura Gomez for inviting me and also to apologizing for having to walk out in the middle. Um, but I was able to push an event back half an hour to be here at least for part of um, this really important and interesting conversation. Um, so it's true that Laura and I went to college together. She was two years ahead of me, as she mentioned. We were actually on the college newspaper together, which meant that she edited my stuff and marked it up and told me uh, where I was right and where I was wrong. And so, and I so I can about that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's true. Um, and so I continue to, to listen to her today. And one of the things she wanted me to make sure to touch upon, as we talked about Charlottesville, was. Um, was how uh, the, the Jew will not replace us and the anti-Semitic dimensions fit into this. And so I am going to partly talk about that, but I also want to make very clear that I think it is, it's an important piece of the story, but it's certainly not um, the most important piece of the story. And I think both of those things we have to hold on to mm -hmm. at the, the same time. So even though I'm focusing on that, it's, it's, um, it's not because I think that's the... Uh, the place where I might otherwise start. But, mm -hmm. um, but as long as we're speaking out of our experiences, um, I come to this, I, I am Jewish, I'm not particularly observant, and I also spent a whole bunch of years living in Charlottesville. Um, so Charlottesville is, of course, both symbol of a much broader set of concerns about white supremacy and how it's operating, but it's also specific. And so for me, what happened in Charlottesville was very specific. Um, Emancipation Park, where the protest, uh, where, where the white supremacist protest was to take place, and um, which used to be called Lee Park, was, I mean, I walked by it, I walked through that park and by that park like probably five times a week. It was just blocks from where I lived. Um, when I moved to Charlottesville, I'd never lived in the South before. How many of you have lived in the South or come from the South? Okay, so a decent number of you. For me, it was new. I grew up in the Bay Area and then spent some years on the East Coast. And I will share that when I got to Charlottesville, the idea that there was this statue to General Lee, I found really shocking, like absolutely shocking. But then I'm also going to confess that it got sort of normalized, right? It just mm -hmm. became this, you know, there were like hippie art festivals in the park and there was that statue. So, so it was both shocking and then became mm -hmm. part of the fabric of the background that was... Um, not as jolting to me on a day-to-day -day basis as in some ways I wish it had remained. Um, I think what I find troubling, I don't, I don't quite know what to make of the explicit anti-Semitism that we are seeing in some of these 
um, spaces where the white supremacists are being especially active. And they were, I mean, let, let, let's name for a minute just how explicit mm -hmm. it all was in Charlottesville, right? I mean, there were Nazi slogans. Mm -hmm. There was, Jew will not replace us as one of the main slogans um, that people were shouting. The mayor of Charlottesville does happen to be Jewish. His name is Siepel. And there were things, people said, what's the creep's name? And the answer was, Jew, 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 right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so it was really, really explicit. And, um, and, one of the things I'm struggling with as I try to process what happened is what I think about that in relationship to the really smart, theoretically sophisticated points that both Laura and Priscilla made about structural racism mm -hmm. and about exceptionalism or non-exceptionalism. Because I don't know what to do with anti-Semitism and those theoretical arguments. There is no doubt in my mind that racism in this country is, as Laura suggested, structural, ubiquitous, and fairly intransigent. Although I'm a Bruin optimist, so I have to believe that there is some hope. But I, 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 th that's easy for me when we're talking about um, African Americans or Latinos, um, that I believe all of those things to be true. I also have a lot of sympathy for the argument that Priscilla was beginning to make, and which I think she's likely to develop further, depending on how the conversation goes, about how, um, how the, the rhetoric of exceptionalism that turns these neo-Nazis into mm -hmm. just misguided young men and fails to understand how this is very tightly on a spectrum that actually goes deeper and broader, I agree with that too. And yet, I don't know what to do with anti-Semitism and those narratives, because I, I don't know if I believe that anti-Semitism is actually that structural, ubiquitous, and intransigent, mm -hmm. or that I believe that, that what we saw there is, mm -hmm. um, relates to a much uh, mm. more widespread framing about about Jewish identity mm -hmm. in America. And I mean, so I mean, this is really more confessional than a mm -hmm. place of answers. Um, certainly, we see it erupting in different places. Certainly, I've had personal experiences with people doing things that were anti Semitic. But frankly, I'm going to be honest, I think I've had fewer of those experiences than every black person in this room has had um, in relationship to their mm -hmm. own race, right? I don't think those two things are. Um, Kind of are the, the the same or ought to be talked about in the same uh, register, and yet dot dot dot. What we saw erupting there suggests that the sort of racial frameworks that are at work here and what's included and what isn't um, are are complex, horrible, messy, and concerning. Um, a, a good a friend of mine was targeted. Um, he's a, a an editor at um, at the New York Times, and he retweeted something many months ago. It wasn't even his own comment. Like he just it was like he retweeted something that was anti-Trump. It wasn't even like I mean it was sort of normal, right? Like it just wasn't even his own original thought or whatnot. And somehow he got targeted, and he began to get hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds mm -hmm. of absolutely vicious messages talking about sending him to the death camps, talking about what he deserved, talking about um, you know Jews as Satan children. And so for me, as somebody with a, a Jewish identity that means something to me, but that isn't actually probably at the top of my own um, frame for my identity characteristics, I don't know what to do with this, right? I don't know how to understand it. And then I also find myself thinking about whether there are any opportunities to use absolutely horrible moments like this one mm -hmm. to, um, to think about how we theorize, to create um, connections and um, locations for recognizing um, similarities across the differences that could be valuable or powerful, both within our local community and perhaps beyond. Um, so for the moment, I'll stop there. Well, I want to start also by... I also want to start by thanking the CRS um, program and um, Professor Gomez and also my, my wonderful co-panelists. I mean, this is, this is an excellent way to start a conversation and, for, and to thank all of you for taking the time to be here. I mean, these are difficult topics and difficult things to, um, to process in our own lives. And so it does take a certain amount of courage 
to um, to be present and to and to participate. So I'm going to start my first round of comments um, by thinking about narrative and counter narrative. And this is something I think as a clinical law professor is very important to me and that we teach. Um, so the ex violent extremists, the, the white extremists in Charlottesville and really all in many cities, it wasn't just Charlottesville, it's a symbol for something larger, um, held as their, they held out as their objective, the history of protecting and preserving Confederate monuments. Um, and so I think it's important to kind of situate what that means um, and, and, and why, why that particular moment and what is the, sim what is the nature of the monuments. Um, so a, a recent report that came out by the Southern Poverty Law Center pointed to the construction of monuments over time. And some of you may have seen um, the graphic that was published online and widely circulated. But it made really clear that the vast majority of the monuments um, were, even though today they do sort of become a little bit of a background in these southern towns, they were erected at very specific moments that were, um, that the, and there was a clear delineation between racial advancement that was happening on the one hand for blacks and then on the other hand um, to really try to demarcate the subordination of blacks and the racial hierarchy that was premised on whites on white superiority okay so there are really two major moments of the construction of these monuments the first was not right after the civil war as i think some people would have you believe but actually 35 years later in, at around 1900 to the 1920s, when um, Jim Crow laws were really being put into effect across the South. So these monuments that were built in town squares all over the South, um, and in many, in many locations were held up high, um, so that you know, the, the individuals were looking down at every, anyone who walked by, and were also put in the center of thriving black communities. Because after the Civil War, there was actually a movement forward for um, for for the Black communities, um, and so they were situated for a particular reason to uh, prevent integration and prevent voting. Okay, so then the second wave, if you follow this theory, can come predictably at the mid 1950s into the 60s during the Civil Rights Movement. Okay, so these um, symbols, these monuments, were erected during some of the most bloody pe bloody periods of. Um, American history, and they uh, and at the, around those times, political figures and, and white community groups came together to say, we need to erect monuments to keep alive the memory of racial terror, the memory of black bodies as property. Okay, so that is really what we're talking about: the pr preservation of white identity during these these really particular times. So, and I bring all of this up because. When Professor Gomez approached me about this event and when I started thinking about what was important to me in this moment and as I was myself unpacking the events of Charlottesville and, and other things happening around the country, um, I really started to think about, uh, and this is something I've been trying to do since the election, like what would a, a world and a community based on freedom look like? Okay, so not what we have today, but what do we want to work, work towards? Okay, not um, liberty, you know, equality is good too, but really freedom for, our, for people. What is that going to look like? And so in some parts of the world, um, Rwanda, South Africa, when there are mass atrocities or large systemic issues that come about, the victims create the monuments. Okay, so it's not um, the perpetrators of the Holocaust. It's not the perpetrators of of apartheid, but it is actually the victims. So, what would the town squares look like? What would our what would be in the background of the art festival if um, actually other people had created the monuments? Um, and you know, this this sort of led me to thinking about um, the Brian Stevenson's new initiative um, with the Equal Justice Institute, where he is trying to uh, have communities erect monuments, small plaques, just small things, to commemorate the lynchings throughout the South. So he has documented hundreds and hundreds of lynchings that have happened throughout the South. 
some of them Mexican American, some of them Mexican, some of them immigrants. And he's really trying to think about what what can we do to commemorate the victims of lynchings and the victims of some of the atrocity of racial terror that's happened in the United States. And I sort of put that out there as as a way of imagining a different world and a, di a different identity and symbolism around the country. Um, and so I say that not because I think that you know, the monuments are really the problem or that we will eradicate our, and unpack white supremacy by, um, by tearing them all down, but because, in, 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 but because of something slightly personal, which is that um, I come from an immigrant family and I moved to a really small town in South Carolina. And I went to public school in South Carolina where I was taught about John C. Calhoun and the Confederate War and the and, and Civil War and the Confederacy. And um, and you know, in that in that sort of spectrum, in that sort of insular community, the points of counter narrative are few. Okay. And so one of the things that was actually very important in my understanding of the history of the South, the true history of the South, as I would as I would say, was a monument that was put up in front of a bowling alley in the parking lot of a bowling alley to commemorate um, three African American students that were murdered during the integration of that bowling alley. So this was this was something that was erected as a part of um, the reconciliation process and sort of the healing process that happened after this really um, very much untold um, moment in the civil rights movement. Um, but that really meant something. So there, there, is a, there is a power in symbolism. There is a power in figuring out what is our counter narrative going to be? What is, what is our story going to be? What do we want it to be in the future? How do we want to retell and repackage what's happened in the country? So I'll end there. Terrific. Thank, thank you all for, for um, those reflections. I'm going to um, take you up, Jennifer, on your, your question, inviting sort of what is the connection between anti-Semitism um, and uh, it's sort of the, the or, or maybe we should put it this way, understanding anti-Semitism as racism and sort of how we, how we understand that. And where I'll start with that is to go back in time and understand that this category of white has really evolved over time, right? It, it's, we have a particular idea today of who's white. People, you know, we, we might actually find that there's, you know, we could, we could do, there are actually these interesting social science studies uh, called photo arrays where they'll put, they'll put cer certain people and then they'll say, what is the race of this person? And people actually will disagree at the, at the margins and, um, about it. So there's not as much fixed in this, you know, it's not as fixed today as we think it is, but we do think today that we know who's white and who's not white. Um, historically, that was much more contested. And there's a wonderful book uh, by a, a emeritus anthropology professor here at UCLA called How Jews Became White Folks. Um, it's by Karen Brodkin. And she talks about the dynamics um, between the uh, 40s and the uh, 70s, or maybe she starts with the 30s, but the dynamics uh, that had to do with government policy and with economics and, uh, in fact, with uh, anti-black racism that moved Jews into the white category. Um, that's a theme that we see historically with respect to other groups, right, that were, were marginally white uh, Irish Americans. Irish immigrants are one group. Italian immigrants are another group. And some of this varied by region, right, but we can go back in history and we can see this. Some of my, my work uh, focuses on, on what I call, or who I call, the original Mexican Americans. And those were the 110,000 Mexican Americans who lived in northern Mexico when the U.S. invaded it in 1846. So those, those Mexicans overnight became American citizens in 1848 with the end of the war. Um, but the story is pretty complicated in terms of how they were incorporated and not incorporated. Um, and the complexities of that, there's two things that uh, I usually say when I, when I give this out. One is to say, you know, the, the phrase that some of you will have heard, which is that we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. Uh, the other is to talk about the first illegal aliens who were whites, Americans, who went to Texas in the 1830s. Mexico encouraged their immigration, and, uh, but they had two requirements, that, that 
those whites coming into Mexico naturalize and that they become Catholics. And according to one historian's estimate, 40% of those in Texas at that time did not follow those rules and say, so they were the first illegals. Um, so thinking though about this process of, you know, sort of who's white and who's not, it's very much, I think, a story of divide and conquer, right? So, well, we'll let you into the club. And on the, uh, if, if you agree to help us enforce that line and who else is excluded for that club. And we can see that in a number of historical examples. I'm not going to take uh, too much time to, to talk about them. But in, 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 uh, in my work on the 19th century, certainly Mexicans are, Mexican Americans, these original Mexican Americans are situated as privileged relative to American Indians and relative to African Americans. And that privilege, right, as marginal as it was, as fragile as it was, and I detail that in my work also, was better than what these other groups had. And so, so I think that there's something to be, uh, there's something to compare there to thinking about where Jews are. And, you know, my take on my take on the, the current moment of, of white supremacy is that these vocal white supremacists are asking the question, who is really white? And their answer is different than what we might answer or what, what you know, we, there could be disagreement on what that is. They're asking who is really American, right? Sort of, and it's, it's fundamentally about who belongs and about their feeling that they are losing or have lost the country. And what made them feel that more than anything? The election of Barack Obama as president, right? So rem remember that it was not so long ago that we were talking about post-racialism. It's the end of racism. We've elected an African-American president. What are you guys complaining about? And we're at a very different place right now, right? So so I think that's that's at least part of the the answer, but I think it's it is something we really need to to you know think more about and uh, and study more. And it's it is it is really a it has really been a moment where we've all thought, wow, this is we we knew we thought we knew a certain thing about racist, and we're finding something else now. So um, so Priscilla. yeah. So I guess I'll pick up on um, Shanid's invitation to think about narrative, and also um, Laura's invitation to think about you know, whites is, is uh, sort of picking up the mantle of sort of the paradigmatic racial victim, right? Um, and I think this is where I want to link it to my, my earlier comments about sort of the weaponization of colorblindness, right? So one of them is, right, while there's maybe this history of white supremacy in this country and racial subordination, individual white people today um, don't benefit from it and aren't, aren't privileged by it, aren't responsible for it. Right? And so as a result, any intervention, any discussion about race, any conversation about racial equity um, is seen as unfair and unwarranted. Right? Um, if, and in addition, right, whites are seen as victims of unrestrained un, uh, identity politics where other ethnic groups, right, because whites are seen as one of many ethnic groups, particularly in this formation of colorblindness, um, are utilizing their identities to disadvantage whites, right? And so one sort of prime example of this is in a case called Croson versus Richmond, which is, um, it, right, was the seat of the Confederacy in Virginia, and there was a constitutional challenge to a set-aside program for black and, and other folks of color who were contractors. And right at the height of timidity, um, uh, right, you have Justice Scalia saying, um, you know, these black folks um, are organizing to get more resources for themselves, to basically self-deal. That's what this is. Black folks have taken over the city council, and now they're trying to use that power as a cudgel um, to beat up white folks, right? Um, and so, again, it's this idea that, that white folks aren't responsible, that, there isn't, that they don't benefit from contemporary um, exclusion and marginalization of communities of color and, um, uh, and uh, the dis temporary distribution of resources. And so any intervention, like an affirmative action program, is, is burdening them unjustly, right? And so you have that not only in our constitutional arena, but also in sort of the public discussion about 
fairness, right? And how our government ought to be organized and who's benefiting from the government and who isn't, right? So there's a study that was recently done um, by some folks over at Yale and they found that they found that white folks believe that black folks are doing much better than they actually are. So they asked, you know, how much do black folks have on average um, in terms of wealth? And they estimated it to be at or more than what they had, right? How much do, what's the average income of black folks? They estimate, and these, these participants estimated, these white participants estimated it to be at or above where they were. And it just sort of like, where are y'all at? Where have you been? What? Right? This sort of like, are you allergic to newspapers? Like, none of this <laughs> is true. But somehow they believe it, right? Because this idea that, that, that communities of color have organized to self-deal, right? To create these programs to benefit them at the expense of whites who are the paradigmatic victims. Um, the whites have, there have also been studies that have demonstrated that whites believe that the biggest problem with racial discrimination is discrimination against white people. Right. And so this breed, this idea that people of color are getting undeserved gains, right, because of how they're organizing the political arena, electing someone like a Barack Obama, um, and that they are outpacing whites by using these programs that disadvantage white folks, right, i.e. whites are the biggest um, uh, victims of discrimination. And that then motivates their political um, expressions and mobilizations and justifies if these young folks, right, the solution before was, well, we'll get rid of white supremacy when all these old white folks die, right? People used to say that, hmm. um, and including Oprah Winfrey, who, you know, I was like, what are you talking about, sis? That's just wrong. But anyway, so, but these are young folks. These are young folks that are doing it. So where are they getting this? This is part of a contemporary narrative around whiteness and white identity that is embattled, that is being outpaced by um, other communities of color, particularly black folks, Latino folks, and Muslims, right? Because of this idea that it's changing the mm -hmm. basic premise of American society in ways that will ultimately lead to the downfall of, of white folks. Mm -hmm. Wow, there's so much here, um, and I'm, I'm going to have to leave in like five minutes. So um, I, I guess a couple of quick just thoughts and responses to some of this very rich discussion. Um, I want to start with something Sunita said about, um, about the meaningfulness of this counter-monument and counter-narrative. And I want to both agree and slightly disagree. That is, I absolutely agree that these monuments matter. I totally support, like I think of course the statue should come down in Charlottesville, I mean that, that's not hard. But I also get worried about the danger that symbolic um, creation substitutes for more meaningful engagement. Um, I don't know how many of you saw, but just in the last week or two at Harvard Law School, they unveiled a little monument to the slaves um, whose labor helped produce the wealth that gave to the school. And I guess I look at that and I think, well, it's better to, to acknowledge than not. But I also think, huh, that doesn't really do much, I think. I mean, so, so I guess I think it's, it's, worth, um, it's worth thinking about the way that these symbols can matter and also the way that they can sometimes be an excuse for not doing Reparations um, more or, significant forms yeah. of reparation or engagement. Um, I thought Laura's comments on on the construction of whiteness were really apt and interesting, although I think they're only part of the story. I do think we have to name that the white supremacists aren't saying down with the Irish mm -hmm. or uh, mm -hmm. farewell, you know, Italy, Italians go back home. Um, and there is something about... Um, about Jewish identity as religious, cultural, blended, um, and let's face it, the Holocaust, right? Racial. I'm not a big fan mm -hmm. of like, you know, the argument on not, Nazism where you raise that, but, but where, where one raises that too quickly. But I do think that mm -hmm. the, um, the historical structural dimensions of anti-Semitism as a trope have a different kind of refrain in power. And I think what I, my, my very provisional interpretation is that that it's it's a more available rhetorical mm -hmm. construct than I I'd fully even realized. I mean, Priscilla mm -hmm. said something, um, or I think I can't remember which of you said something about how I think it was you, Laura, that we were. It, it almost looked like we could be post-racial, except now not. And there's something we never were that close to being post-racial, mm -hmm. sadly. I mean, I, I you know whatever. But um, but with this, it it 
it looked like this was substantially more buried and disappeared mm. than it turns out to be. And I just don't think that's true about Irish and Italian identities, for example. It's not that I'm not saying there aren't other mm -hmm. forms of axes, but I think there is something, something um, different here. Um, I think Priscilla's arguments are, are really important and powerful, and I hope I have to go, but I hope we'll circle back to them um, collectively, because I think that um, the sort of weaponization of colorblindness is, um, is a, a deep structural concern, um, and one that's been baked into law in a variety mm -hmm. of ways mm -hmm. that make it um, even more challenging for individuals to disrupt or um, operate against. And so as we think about what comes mm -hmm. next, I think that's incredibly interesting and important. Um, so there's lots more to be said and three wonderful people to engage with saying it. I think before I go, I do have to note one thing that I just think is kind of fabulous, which is that this is a program that is not about gender and we're four women sitting here. And that yeah. doesn't have to be And um, in that <laughs> spirit, let's thank our female dean for the <laughs> <laughs> With Dean Manukin's point that you know, monument, no monument, but it, but but that um, you know, for me, it's just a way for us to kind of think about how we talk about what the counter narrative would be, what we would want our society to look like, and and how we would want it to be structured. Um, so I thought, uh, you know, I would also take up the opportunity to think a little bit about um, about policing and the role of police in maintaining. Um, uh, white supremacy and sort of um, broad scale kind of what is going on in the country around policing. Um, so, so, so Jeff Sessions, who is now the um, top law enforcement officer in the country, has really done everything he can um, to erode even the, um, you know, some might say, uh, slight gains that we achieved during the Obama administration. Um, he called for a review of all consent decrees. And this was you know, it, a very deliberate attempt to halt the implementation of the reform processes that were underway in a number of cities around the country. Um, that came after very well documented um, rampant violence and attacks on predominantly black communities around the country. Um, and he has really criticized the decrees and also all other forms of, of criminal justice reform, sentencing reform. I mean, the list could go on. Um, and he's really saying that all of these reform measures that came about um, in the last prior administration and also for the past few decades by organizers, advocates, not just because of the Department of Justice, um, he's saying that those have created barriers for police work and they create barriers to safety. And he claims that these, these um, reform me measures actually risk the safety of police. So, um, you know, when all this was unfolding, I was living in, um, in Maryland, in the, in the, in the D.C., Maryland area, and I, do, I had done some work and, and continue to do work with folks in Baltimore that are working on the consent decree, but also just police, police issues generally. And it was really startling to hear this um, after a very well-documented report uh, coming out of the Justice Department that showed um, a number of things, but, it, but, it, but in particular, it's sexual violence against black women and girls. I mean, this was just, it was just horrendous, um, the position that um, the Department of Justice I had taken, but it wasn't really a surprise. It wasn't really surprising to anyone. Um, and so his, you know, we, we, it's important to kind of think through his like veiled attempt to adopt this trope of police safety, okay? And I think that blue lives matter, right? Um, that really doesn't fool anybody. We know what he's really trying to do. Um, he's saying that police departments that have extensive records of violence um, you know, violating the Constitution, um, discriminating against, you know, certain certain groups, um, that they can get away with it. And nobody is really going to do anything about it from the federal government. Um, and we can, you know, we can contest and we can question the extent to which 
the consent decrees or any of these reform measures, and especially I think the 21st Century Police Task Force, like whether that was really ever going to get us anywhere or whether they were really going to ever, it was going to get get to any of the root causes behind behind the structural problems of policing. Um, but you know, th putting that aside, we can say that there were some. Maybe we can all agree that there were some advances that were being made. Um, but uh, but but regardless of uh, you know of that. We also know that this administration has really ignored hard evidence that public safety threats, of the connection between public safety threats when the perpetrators are white nationalists. Okay, so Jeff Sessions ignored intelligence information that made the events of Charlottesville really clear that the biggest threat of terrorism in the U.S. is from organized white nationalists. Um, some of you may have heard that in May, in May, the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI warned of the of pervasive white supremacist attacks. And since two, the year 2000, um, more violent attacks and deaths have been at the hands of white nationalists than any other domestic terror group. Um, but, you know, that, that wasn't actually news in the intelligence community. As far back as 2006, there was an FBI uh, bulletin that was, um, that was released that identified the history of white supremacist infiltration within the police department. So just think of that. There was white supremacists were targeting law enforcement, local law enforcement agencies, as the site of expanding its membership and infiltrating um, in order to get in, gain information and um, identify targets for violent actions. And in this bulletin, uh, one thing I thought that was really interesting when I first read it was this idea of ghost skin. Okay, so ghost skins are white people who blend into society and covertly advance white supremacist causes. And this is the FBI that's bringing this forward to the intelligence community. Um, and so then the, the bulletin identifies that many white supremacist groups, blogs, had been encouraging ghost skins to join the police in order to get information. Okay, um, now this is in 2006. And then in 2009, um, there was a report that a former uh, senior analyst for terrorism at DHS said that right-wing extremism had become the largest domestic terror threat in the country. And he recently um, published an op-ed in the Washington Post where he said, everybody ignored me. Because I used the word right-wing extremism, the Republicans heckled me and, and defunded all the programs that they had been created to try to gather intelligence on white nationalist groups. Okay, so and most recently, the administration took funding, defunded an organization that was um, whose objective was to help integrate neo Nazis that had decided to leave the neo Nazi organizations. Okay, so there is right now there is no effort to try to monitor or um, you know watch out for what is the largest domestic terror threat in the country, and that really. You know that, and there is a, there is a palpable connection between those those organizing efforts and law enforcement in the country. And we know that the first um, police to, the first police in the South were slave catchers and night's watchmen. So that history is long; it's very hard to erode that that um, that sort of connection. So I'll, I'll kind of leave it there. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot a lot that we could go on talking about, but we've come to that point in the program where I'd like to hear from some of you in the audience. Um, and I'm thinking maybe we could take uh, four questions or comments and then, and then we'll have some time to engage them or respond. So we'll take four immediately like in response, you know, like, like in quick succession. Uh, yes. So the question was about, um, it was following up on Priscilla's comments about 
weaponizing the ideology of colorblindness in the law, and particularly rep referencing a case that someone else are reading right now, which is Iqbal versus Ashcroft. Um, and so we'll take a couple more questions, and then we'll come back. I'm sure, Priscilla, you're going to want to address that. So a few more questions, yeah? So um, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, the gentleman in the glasses. Yes. Yeah, uh, do you think that this legal regime of rights, rights, discourse, civil rights, do you think that ultimately empowers color blindness? And, and sorry, I forgot to, I didn't restate your question just in case people weren't able to hear it, so I'll do that. Um, so the second question was about the, um, the laws that, sort of the, the laws that butt up against uh, free speech and expression and disturbance and stopping uh, functioning of, of private or public activities. Um, and this, then this third question uh, was about colorblindness. Um, sorry, can you just repeat it again? Rights discourse. So Civil rights discourse. So in a way, you're, at least what I'm hearing is that you're asking us to reflect a bit on how the law is limited in what it can do, or perhaps how it becomes co-opted by um, more conservative elements. Yes. We're glad you're here. Wonderful question. So, um, the question, the Jasmine. Oh, okay. That was four. Okay, I thought maybe you were telling me something else, other other thing crucial. So we'll we'll try to come back for more more questions. But but the question here was um, was about allies and what allies. Uh, uh, in this movement can do now. And, and I actually was going to come back to that at some point and, and sort of come back to some, some positive um, things. So um, do you want to start, Priscilla? Yeah, and actually I think the, the first and third questions I think yeah. are related. Yeah. Um, because I think yeah, when you asked your question, I think the person was somewhere over here, um, or maybe over, you were over here, um, the Iqbal question. I, I think about the work of Derek Bell and, and the, his writings on the way that courts and, um, and law uses sort of abstract terms and abstract phrases, abstract doctrine to mask expressions of white power. Right, so Iqbal is obviously one example. They're using very abstract language around civil procedure and pleading and so forth. Um, when it, what it does is fundamentally deny um, any sort of remedy for discrimination, right? Um, particularly profiling, racialization, um, and state violence directed toward uh, Muslim populations. And I think that that's a, another piece of the, the question that was being asked about sort of rights discourse, right? It enables this sort of formalism that can be deployed in a register that suggests it's about equality, but in fact is reinforcing um, pre-existing um, hierarchies and 
um, preserving racial power. Yeah, well, so I'm, I'm going to say that, um, so Iqbal was litigated alongside another case called Turkmen that was one of the cases that I worked at um, in my prior job at the Center for Constitutional Rights. And um, it was, it actually went to the Supreme Court last year, and we lost at the Supreme Court, um, but had won at the Second Circuit level. And I would really encourage all the 1Ls to go and read that opinion. At the sec it it's Turkmen versus Ashcroft, and in the Supreme Court, it was um, Abbasi versus Ziegler. So what happened in this companion case, um, Iqbal, as you know if you've read the case, was really about um, Muslims that were held under sort of a cover of a criminal confinement. So Turkmen is a case that is about non-citizen detention. And so the conditions of confinement are very squarely put forward. And that case, um, what the, the, the version of the complaint that went forward um, was after um, Iqbal was decided and after five years of discovery had been concluded and after there was massive amounts of evidence of a connection between the highest level of officials in the FBI and Attorney General Ashcroft himself. And so I would say that the Supreme Court decided that they were going to maintain um, no mechanism of accountability for these top level officials. And it was all cloaked in this, um, this sort of language of, um, you know, law enforcement can't do their job. We really need to be thinking about safety. And they carved out um, within, so, you know, the mechanism to file cases when someone is in federal custody is a Bivens action. It's, it's been around for, for decades. And they said this was exceptional because of the national security emergency that we were under. Um, what's interesting about, what was interesting in the argument was the colloquy between um, Rachel Mirapol, who's arguing, and the justices about the impending Trump administration. Because this was argued the day after the inauguration. So I really, it's a really interesting argument. It was a really, I took students to the, to the argument. And, um, you know, so it doesn't take away from anything that Professor Oshin is saying, but, you know, there is, there, I think there is a value, and I'm saying, speaking uh, as a former civil rights litigator, there is a value also in pushing forward um, these, uh, these examples and these cases and, and trying to make people whole again and, and getting victories from courts where people say that people's rights have been, val uh, have been violated. It does validate people's experiences. Um, even it, just to hear a person in power mm. say that there is something wrong. So the Second Circuit opinion ends with this excellent quote about you know, the need for courts to step in and in, especially in the face of the most egregious violations happening in the country, and especially in times when police will um, will will exercise the worst of, of their authority. Terrific. I will address the remaining two questions. So, uh, a word first about the question about the First Amendment. So, uh, the First Amendment rights of expression, uh, speech, and protest are of course, fundamental to, uh, to our national identity and fundamental as well to the sphere in which we are right now and sort of we're at a public university. Um, and I always say that, uh, that our, our First Amendment rights have to be sort of whatever they are in society, they're at their maximum on a public university campus and they should be. But the law has never recognized those First Amendment rights as unlimited. So, for example, you think about uh, a speech that is dangerous, and the classic example is shouting fire in a crowded theater, right? That is not a matter of free speech. That is a matter of public safety. Um, uh, there's a fighting words exception under the First Amendment, right? So, to the extent that you, you uh, and this is in the, in the historic context of the doctrine, this case is, is at an individual level, right? So somebody shouting epithets at you specifically, um, that is, is not something that means that you can't respond by uh, punching them or otherwise uh, reacting. Um, there's also an interesting dynamic in that case law about sort of how the proper masculine response would, would look. Mm -hmm. um, but but in the context of Charlottesville, I mean, one of the things that was stunning to me was the lack of 
police response, mm -hmm. right, to the violence that they were seeing. Um, and of course, uh, you know, this is not an original thought. Um, many other people had this idea, but, but sort of imagining how if that had not been uh, white marchers, white protests, how the police would have responded. Um, in fact, we did see some of that later in subsequent uh, protests, right? And certainly we've, we've seen it in other contexts in terms of very recent this week and last week in terms of protests. Um, I do want to turn to that, that fourth question that you asked, which was really, really an important one. And I was thinking about, and maybe one of you can help me or somebody in the audience can, I couldn't remember the author, but there is a really a uh, wonderful piece in which the author, who is white, um, encourages readers, white readers, um, to be race traitors. And how he defines race traitors is people who are, ba white people who are gonna basically say, yes, I'm white and I have white privilege, but I am going to constantly acknowledge that I'm going to ally myself uh, with oppressed peoples um, and, and really, you know, not just be that white person who doesn't say something where, when they're in that, that setting where there aren't people of color around and they hear something racist or they see something racist. Um, does anybody remember who that no. author was? Um, he teaches, he, he got, he's in New Orleans. I know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we're narrowing it down, but... Uh, <laughs> Okay, so um, Jasleen, Jasleen Coley, Executive Director of the Critical Race Studies Program. Can I circle back to my last question? Uh, Can I circle back to my last question? And in that spirit, why don't we just have um, a couple minutes of reflection so you can respond to Jasleen's question, um, but also any closing statements that you have. Sunita, do you want to go first? And and but but let's we'll we'll sort of wrap it up. Um, Is your, yeah. When I was discussing the right wing extremism, because it's like it's the same language, right? Like the Muslim radical Muslim extremists, it's the same language. Um, and I mean, I guess what I would what I would say about the war on terror um, is that it's the, it's 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 just being used to mask, um, you know, a number of policies that the that are being rolled out. I mean. You know the, the travel ban, the um, which is not actually a new idea. I mean, I can recall mm -hmm. when I lived in Georgia mm -hmm. that that the Congress there was voting on whether mm -hmm. or not to allow Muslims to live in Georgia anymore and after 9/11. I mean, this is just a lot of these ideas are being recycled. They're coming from some of these white supremacist blogs from from over a decade decade ago. So we know where these are coming from. These ideas are coming from. Um, and, and I guess I would just say, like, as my sort of closing to tie back to this um, statement that was said before, is that, you know, we, we all, no matter what community we come from, we all come from a tradition of resistance and struggle. And so we have to figure out what we're going to do. So, uh, there, you know, this slogan that silence is violence is becoming really common in protest. But I actually think we need to take, we need to be, we need to go farther than just saying, um, I'm not going to be silent anymore. And I think for anybody that 
ha has um, some benefit, whether it's explicitly or implicitly, from anti-black racism. I would put myself in that category. That it's important to ask ourselves, like, what is the material risk that we're willing to take right now? What is the, are we actually willing to put um, put our bodies on the line in any way? And I'm and I and I think I was thinking a little bit about John Brown and Harper Sperry and and the white radical tradition um, that that there was in the past. And how do we embrace that kind of risk taking as we move forward and think again about freedom? Like what would society look like that's based on freedom? Um, so I'm going to uh, take a few questions, including Jesslene's, and talk a little bit. Um, uh, I think there's one more. Uh, and then, and then um, uh, speak to this question about um, solidarity. So one, this, this question about terrorism, and I think terrorism and immigration are obviously um, related, right? So, but, and part of where I want to sort of pick up is this question of white innocence, sort of this fundamental notion of white mm -hmm. innocence. So that's part of why um, white terrorism, white supremacist organization, right, white militaristic groups, right, who have been operating over the last, you know, forever, right? But especially, um, right, you can think about like Clive and Bundy, who mm -hmm. was literally like mm -hmm. pointing guns at federal mm -hmm. agents, mm -hmm. um, right? You have people like in, in um, uh, you know, the, the church shooting in uh, mm -hmm. Charleston, right? All of these examples of white racial terror um, that are never called white racial terror, right? And that's part of the preservation of white collective innocence. It can only be condemned in individual terms, and it's never a part of a structure of white supremacist ideology um, that needs to be taken on as a matter of um, government policy, um, right? So that's, that's one. The other way that I think um, white innocence comes into play when we're talking about, um, for example, the Muslim ban or approaches to um, terrorism is this idea that white culture is under threat. So I would encourage you all to read. I generally would never encourage you to read anything Donald Trump has said or written. I don't know if he writes anything, but maybe tweets. Um, but right, read the speech that he gave in Poland. Um, he talks about how the West is embattled, right, by these forces around the world, by by Islam, right, by Islam. You know, this this sort of magical phrase that he uses, Islam, radical terrorism, or whatever, right. So he talks about this sort of classic. Um, Orientalism, right? Mm -hmm. That the that that this this wave of Islamic terrorism is threatening to the basic existence of European civilization, um, and he places himself and his allies as sort of the defenders, right? And so do white supremacists. So I think that's part of it, right? This innocence, this victimization mentality that is a part of this ideology is a part of the response to terrorism, so there's response to Muslim communities, and it's also a response in terms of immigration, right? This idea that whites are innocent, are embattled by these, right, by folks coming up from the southern border, nowhere else, not visas, right, not, not all the other ways that folks came to this country, but coming up from the southern border are threats to white um, economic security, right? Um, and so there's a, another way in which um, white innocence and white victimization sort of comes up in, a, in addition to sort of this idea that white culture is under um, threat by the presence of um, folks of color, particularly from Mexico and Central America. So I think those are there are two, two of the ways that, um, that whiteness plays a role in structuring our responses to white racial terrorism, terrorism that is associated with Muslim communities and Muslim communities and immigration more generally. On the question of um, solidarity, I, I agree with uh, Sunita, and I think about um, uh, a letter that James Baldwin wrote to Angela Davis um, when she was facing the death penalty uh, in the state of California. And he wrote to her and he said, um, I will fight for your life as if it were my own, because it is. For if they come for you tonight, they will come for me in the morning. And so I think we have to see um, how all these different structures are linked while we may be talking about Islamophobia and the Muslim ban or attacks on women's reproductive autonomy, particularly women of color. If we're talking about mass incarceration or immigration, right? We need to understand how the edifice of white supremacy is unifying all of them. Um, uh, and so we need to fight for each other as if, you know, the other person's life is your own.
and get in the way, right? I think that's mm -hmm. another important piece that James Baldwin is referring to, get in, getting in the way. Thank you. I'll, I'll just make a, a very bright, uh, very brief closing comment as well. And coming back to the questions I asked that are, I think, at the center of the white nationalist movement, including linking to this notion, uh, this the speech that he mm -hmm. that President Trump gave in Poland, which is again, who is really white? Who is really American? Those are the fundamental sort of organizing questions of this um, of this white supremacist movement. Um, and I really like, Sunita, the, the question that you asked, what material sacrifices it, is each of us willing to make at this moment? And I guess what I would do is link that to a very particular positioning of the 800,000 uh, DACA, mm -hmm. young DACA recipients who are living in a such a precarious moment. And we have 750 DACA students here at UCLA and probably more students who are uh, undocumented but not uh, documented. And, you know, that, that, that uh, vulnerability that they're living at. And then we have millions more who are living with the threat of deportation every day. Um, and we've become to just think this is normal and this is an acceptable way to have a society mm -hmm. when the, you know, when we, we, the, 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 we really have to, I think we really have to, each of us question deeply, what is the line for us? What are we prepared to do um, in the face of these pressures now? And also making sure that we make it okay for people in our circles to come out as as vulnerable in these ways and welcoming them into the community, welcoming them, welcoming them as part of the society um, and part of this community at UCLA and um, in general. So um, I want to thank you all for joining us and uh, we look forward to uh, the, the second part of this conversation on October 24th. Thank you. Thank you.